<laughs> okay, my channel, we are live. Let's go. <laughs> okay, welcome back to e commerce undercover. How are you doing today, Martin? I'm doing awesome. What, what about you, Michael? Oh, I'm just glad your microphone is working now. <laughs> yeah, now it's working fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for coming in and doing this. I want to thank our guest as well, Morton Ness, the EVP of technology at Bluestone PIM. Thankfully, it's on the screen. Yeah. So I don't even have to remember the name. <laughs> Morton, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Thanks, Michael. It's um, nice to be on the show. Thank you. Super duper. Can you, can you start with giving us maybe a little bit of your background just for context? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll start at the very beginning. So, <laughs> you know, born and raised in, in Norway. Uh, uh, did my senior year in, uh, at high school in the U.S. So that's where I get kind of the, <laughs> the, the, the U.S., uh, I guess, uh, sound. Um, <laughs> Uh, went to uh, yeah, and then I went to university and and I um, started studying economics actually, and then uh, sort of after two years I had a an intervention with myself <laughs> where I <laughs> where I had to to look at if, if this was really uh, what I wanted to do with my life. So uh, and and then I I found out that I actually always been a nerd like deep down, yeah. and I switched majors to to IT. So, uh, so, so that's, uh, that's how I got into IT, but I've always been, you know, from way back in the eighties, you know, with computers. But what, is that, what does that mean? I mean, I'm probably 10 years older than you or probably more, maybe 15 or 20, actually. Like for me being a nerd, it meant having like a TRS-80 Radio Shack Tandy computer with a tape drive connected to it. That's something we actually had yeah. in school. Like, what did you have that made you feel nerdy? Uh, well, I had the Commodore 64. Okay, that qualifies. Remember that one? I do, I do. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, definitely yeah. qualifies. And it started out with a tape drive, but I upgraded to a disk drive. I loved it. You must have felt like you were in the future when you had that. Yeah, that was that was great. That was awesome. I have no idea what you're talking about, no, guys. <laughs> I, you know, you know what's funny is, Morton, I was going to say we may as well be speaking French because, but Ben Martin is French, so he would understand that. So it, it, it didn't really work. <laughs> Where did you go to high school in the United States? Oh, in Michigan. So, uh, so that was an exchange year in in um, in Michigan. Yeah. And was was that something that you chose to do? Was it something that your parents sort of recommended you do? No, it was actually something that I chose to do. So, uh, yeah. So that was good. Um, yeah. And then uh, after that, of course, uh, you know, went to university, and like I said, I I switched to IT after a while. And, uh, and then I, uh, I got my first job, you know, a uh, systems consultant and a developer. And, um, and then I, um, I sort of, <laughs> uh, after a year or two of that, I, I sort of got into a situation where I, I had to, uh, you know, had to be sales support for, for a, a sales rep. So yeah. there was a senior sales rep that needed a tech, techie guy to help him helping out with a major client. We actually had to go to Sweden and all of that. And it was quite a big thing. And, and uh, I, I remember joining him there. And, and after, um, you know, just 15 minutes into, into that uh, uh, meeting with the client, I was like, what the hell is this, this uh, sales guy doing here? You what? know, right. <laughs> and I was like this, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I can do this. <laughs> And then, and then I was, that was like a, a little bit of a life changing moment for me because I've, I'd been like, a, you know, a developer, a consultant and, and all of that. And then I suddenly started talking quite a lot. And then, and then um, I, I started doing more of that and obviously, you know, climbed the corporate ladder uh, over the years. Uh, but I think that uh, what's probably most interesting about my, my background after that was, was that I started working with SaaS solutions and pure SaaS solutions back in 2007. Wow. So, so I've been doing that for 14 years. So that, that was quite, quite early with, with SaaS and, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, tr trying to convince people that the, that was the future. <laughs> <laughs> and you are right. Like if we check like nowadays, how many SaaS companies are operating and are successful like this, tons of them. Well, even the ones that weren't before, like Microsoft and mm -hmm. Adobe are basically big software as a service companies, right? You subscribe to them as opposed to buying mm -hmm. 
Can you talk yes, about exactly. can you talk about PIM? What exactly is PIM? So uh, PIM is kind of boring, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's just be honest. Uh, it's uh, it's product information management, right? right. So that's that's the um, that's what it uh, stands for. Uh, but uh, in in practice, is I, I like to compare it to the like the transmission of a car. <laughs> it, okay. You know, it's, it's there. You don't see it, but it's it's definitely necessary to make the car move forward. Yeah, uh, and and it's like that. Everyone that has shopped online has has probably used a PIM, but they're they're not realizing uh, realizing that they they've done that. Right. Because um, what a PIM does is that it. Um, it can, or one of the things that it does is is that it feeds sort of a web shop with all the all the product information, like uh, products specification, uh, you know, inf a, a, all the information, all the pictures, everything that is is uh, connected to a, um, a product is actually. So can we say like, for example, CMS like WordPress or Shopify includes a PIM inside of their CMS? Yeah, uh, uh, they, they also do that. So, so when, you have, um, when you have just a few products, like you have five, let's say 500 products, then you can definitely just use Shopify and the built-in sort of PIM in the Sh Shopify um, uh, system. Or you can, or if you have a CMS, you can definitely use uh, use that in um, in the CMS. But the problem starts when you have more products. Let's say you have three hundred thousand, you know, <laughs> half a million, two million products. Then okay. That approach will not work at all. Then you'll you you will definitely need a PIM. So I want to back up for a second, and I want to say that PIM actually is not boring at all. <laughs> Oh, that, that's cool. <laughs> because, no, it, it can't be, right? Because none of the things that we take for granted, particularly in modern e-commerce, which is what this show is about and talks about, would be possible without, what did you say, a product information, product information management, right? It just would be impossible. Right. One it, of the, it, like, at least for the bigger shops, like, you know, yeah, not even, uh, that, not, that, that would not work at all. No, they couldn't exist, right? Because every product that every watchmaker, so I went back to watches again, and every consumer products maker and every um, shoemaker, the only way that that product gets differentiated is through that product information management, some numbers, some attributes, and some way that it can be differentiated. And all that gets codified into a PIM. And without it, you couldn't even do so even a price comparison site makes no sense without a PIM, right? Because I don't even know that those two products are the same. They could be two pairs of brown shoes, but if they're not from the same maker, if it's not the same grade of leather, if it's not made in the same place, well, then it's not even a price comparison. So at the core of all of this stuff that's happening today in e-commerce is some product information management. And sure, maybe it doesn't matter <clears throat> if you're running like an individual seller, but it might actually. And as individual sellers become more prevalent, Right? If you look at the big marketplaces like Amazon or like Shopee or like Lazada, if they're using stores built by Dr. Tech or by Shopify, at some level, they're going to be fed into the um, price comparison engines as well. And if they're using the same products, then people can start doing all these other comparisons. Is that fair or am I just making this up? No, you're, you're definitely, it's, it's definitely true what you're saying, but um, uh, it doesn't mean that you you can't do commerce without a, a PIM, uh, like uh, low scale, you can do this, sure. <laughs> you know, small shops, but, but at the, the enterprise level, what you're saying is definitely true. Yeah, for sure. Can you talk about its impact on omni-channel as well? Well, yeah. So, so that's, that's sort of the beauty of PIM is, is that what, what you would do if you don't have a PIM is that you have to uh, go into, like if, if you have, like let's say the price is changing on the product, right? So you have to go, go to uh, you know Amazon and change the price there, and then you have to go to eBay and change the price there, and then you have to go to your website and then you know uh, or your commerce site, and then you have to change the product information there. So instead of doing that, you're doing it in one place, and sort of that that information is is fed out or, or uh, you know to, uh, to the channels. So that's that's the 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 uh, I guess one of the 
best things about having a PIM is that you, you, you get to have one place, one source of truth. That's, that's the goal, really. And how does Bluestone itself work? How is it differentiated? In other words, if I'm using the Bluestone PIM, like you said, and I'm an omni-channel seller, I have software that you run that I pay for as a service where I can sort of fix it in one place and then it goes out to all the marketplaces and all the other channels where I sell and it just changes it automatically without me having to go to each one of those individual places to do that? Yeah, uh, that's simplifying it a little bit. <laughs> well, is, I'm, I'm really interested in how the back end tech works as well, right? So I want sure, to simplify sure. it just to see if I understood it. Yeah, that, that's, that's, basically, that's basically the, basically right. But um, so, and it com uh, uh, depends on which channels you're connected to. So we have some like some native uh, connectors like Magento and Amazon and stuff like that, right. where, where, where it's just native and you can just uh, use Bluestone PIM to connect directly. Uh, and then you, uh, we have uh, um, data feed uh, sort of uh, partners that, that we use for, like if a customer wants to, uh, I don't know, use Walmart, we don't have a special connector for Walmart yet. So, so then we use a syndication partner. You know, uh, so that that's sort of how how it works. Um, yeah. But how, so how do you go out? How does Bluestone go out? You know, if I go to something like what is it, Ali? What was that thing we were talking about? AliExpress. Ali AliExpress, and all of the you know Chinese sourcing places. There are just millions and millions of products. So like, how is it possible to keep up with? all of the products that get created. I mean, I can't imagine how many products get created every day, much less every week or every month, right? How do you keep up with all yeah. that? Yeah, and, and that's, that's a key point you're touching there is, is that uh, um, that's sort of the beauty of, of the cloud and, and a SaaS solution, the scalability and the availability. Uh, our solution is, is based in AWS. So we're using Amazon. Okay. And uh, that means that, that um, our offering is, is basically available all over the world. So we have like our latest customer is, is uh, in, in um, Australia, right? And the customer before that was in, in uh, California. So mm -hmm. you see the, 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 the span there. And, and also what you said about the, the, the millions of products being created. Right. Being in, in uh, a partner of like the biggest cloud provider in, on earth uh, is, is uh, sort of, <laughs> um, yeah, a key um, point for us to, to be, uh, to be um, yeah, partnering up with, uh, with Amazon to be, make sure that we can scale our, our product to basically infinity. But how do you get all the information for each product? In other words, let's say I built a new product today, well, I have a factory. How do you get yeah. that though? That's a great question, uh, because that that's different from uh, from uh, vendor to vendor how right. they do that. But basically, very often uh, a product is born in the ERP system. So that's where you get a you know you get your product number and you get some basic information, and then so we eighty percent of our uh, of our um, projects or our new customers where we're connecting to some sort of ERP system. So that's where we sort of get the basics out. And then uh, you enrich the, the products in the, the, the PIM and you also make sure that you have um, good quality. So that's also one of the, th the things that the PIM does is that you, you add enrich the product and, and you make sure that it has the right product information quality. So there are actually some uh, some features uh, built into our system to make sure, like you can set up a set of rules to make sure that uh, this product does not leave or, or does not, uh, are, is not published to any channel before it has, uh, you know, uh, good enough uh, pictures. Uh, you know, the, the description is uh, more than 150 characters, blah, blah, blah. All sorts of rules you can set up. So that makes the quality um, ensures good quality. And that's very important for them. How many attributes do you think each product has before you, before, <laughs> before Bluestone considers it to be complete or is it just different for every product and every product type? Exactly. It's okay. very different for every, uh, every product. So we have, uh, we have uh, customers that have like 30 
like 15, 30, you know, something right. like that. And we have customers that have 1500 <laughs> and we're actually looking at a customer with 4,000 now. So, uh, so that, that, that's uh, one of the things that is very, very different uh, from each and every customer. And that's also what makes this uh, a little bit exciting is, is that we see, I told you it was trying... important. <laughs> yeah. I got you on my side now. <laughs> yeah. You, you convinced me. <laughs> Probably isn't important. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, um, uh, where was I? I, you I said can't it, even the thing that makes it exciting is, and then I interrupted you. Oh, I do this yeah, all the time. Yeah, and now I can't remember what, what it was. <laughs> See, it's so exciting we both forgot. <laughs> no, we were talking about the attributes and the number of attributes and how you keep track of all those attributes for your clients. Sure, sure. Um, well, like I said, we have like uh, customers with, with few attributes and then, and then we have uh, uh, customers with, uh, with a lot of attributes and uh, and. Uh, and it really uh, is different from customer to customer. And that's what is exciting is that we get a lot of very, very, very different customers. Like we have uh, customers dealing with jewelry. We mm -hmm. have customers dealing with, you know, dental supplies. Uh, you know, they, they have building uh, materials. Uh, <laughs> you name it. It has to be a very, very flexible uh, system in order to handle uh, all, all, all those sorts of different, you know, types of products. Is this a two-sided market? And I'll tell you what I mean. If I'm a big seller, right, and I have a thousand products or 200,000 products, I'm definitely going to need a PIM to be able to manage all the product information that I have. But that product information is probably, is it going to be maintained by me? Or am I connecting, like you said, to my supplier's ERP system? So does that mean you have clients on both sides where you go to the suppliers and say, you need to connect to Bluestone PIM, PIM so that my clients can then use your PIM data, your product information management data in their system so that they can sell more stuff. Is that the way that works? So you're selling to two types of customers? You know, these are great questions. I, I'm, I'm thinking you've prepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think this was amateur hour? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is this is this is a great um, uh, great question. How do I answer that? Um, the the two sides. Just repeat for me. What what, are, what what were the two sides there? So two sides are the supplier, right? That they have to have great product information management on their side because if they don't, yeah, they'll never yeah. be able to make sales, right? They won't be able to keep track yeah. of any of the things. But also the the buyers of those products. So the yeah. sellers, the big marketplaces they'll need to have access to that too. So does Bluestone PIM connect those two together? In other words, connecting to the ERP system of the supplier and then feed that into the database of the seller? Well, like I said, that, that's a great question because it actually shows how, uh, how a PIM can be used very different, differently. So you can, you can have it um, like we have a large customer, a ferry mm -hmm. company in, in the Nordics. Uh, they're actually using the PIM on the sort of the supplier side, not towards the customer facing channels. Yep. They have sort of, uh, they have sort of um, control of the customer. You know, that, that, that's not where the complexity is. The complexity for them is that they have 800 suppliers. Right. Right. So right. actually they put the PIM before the ERP to connect to all the uh, suppliers. And, and that's where we, uh, we sort of gather the data and then we sort of feed it into the, uh, they have like a data hub and then it go, goes into the, the ERP. So right. that just shows, uh, it, it's, it's, that's one, one way of doing, doing it and it's not the traditional way. Right, but, think, go ahead. Yeah, uh, but then we have like uh, the, the other and the traditional uh, way of doing it, which is probably, you know, towards the customer facing channels. And the interesting part that was, uh, was what you talked about the, or the question, how, how do you enrich the products? And right. that's what we're seeing now is that actually some of our customers have um, uh, um, made sort of their suppliers enrich the uh, products for them. So interesting. <laughs> but actually, yeah. that, so, so that makes sense. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, and that's ho the holy grail, right? Because they, they've actually made that happen is that they, we, we have a feature in our system, which is sort of a personalized UI, uh, where we make a sort of a supplier portal. 
And that means that you can, you can ask your supplier, uh, make a task directly in the PIM for the supplier and say that, you know, this picture and this, uh, this and that is not good enough. And we'll, uh, the system will send an email and you'll get a, your separate logon and you set your separate UI to actually enrich that from the supplier side. So there's a communication tool built inside the ERP. So, I mean, not the ERP, it's built into the PIM so that the supplier and the purchaser can communicate with each other inside sort of the product management environment, yeah? Yeah. That's what we're seeing now. And that's sort of like, imagine that is, is like the holy grail if you can get your suppliers to enrich the products <laughs> for you instead of you doing it. <laughs> that yeah, would I be mean, so great. Yeah, and, more, and even more so, Right. Getting someone to stay inside your system. So not leave the system to go get more data somewhere else or not leave the system to communicate via telephone, via email, via some other thing means that the more time they spend there, the more they'll use it. And I think most people, when they think about product information management, you hinted at this, think more about e-commerce, like individual e-commerce, than they think about B2B e-commerce, which is exploding almost as much, if not more than B2C e-commerce. And if you think about a product information management system, just to connect businesses to businesses, like you said, the big, what was it, a ferry company in the Nordics? Yeah. To their 800 product suppliers. That's a very complex operation that's reliant yes. on those products, not just for fun at Christmas time, but for actual travel and safety and things that really matter. And if they can't have the proper PIM in place with the proper enriched data, they could have problems. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a key system in that uh, regard. Yeah. I think you should be a salesman for Bluestone. You, you, you sell the product so good. I feel like I've nailed this. I got to leave, guys, because I got to go see a customer to sell a pin to. Just, can you guys handle this now? I'll be back in like 15 minutes. I got to make a phone call. You should hire Michael. <laughs> yeah, we should hire Michael out. Uh, it's been good. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, can you just run us through again some of the technology that you use? I think the ones that I referenced were the microservices and the APIs, but if there's more behind them, and maybe you can talk in detail about the overall philosophy and then break it down for each one of those individual components, if that's fair. Sure, that's fair, but it's a large question. <laughs> it is, I know, but I'm so interested. So we have yeah. five so, hours ahead of us, so that's fine. <laughs> excellent. Um, so, uh, Bluestone PIM is actually um, made as, as a, uh, m uh, like the, oh, sorry, let's start again. Can you, can you, sorry, Michael, <laughs> can you do that again? I can. So, yeah. can you talk about the components and the overall technology philosophy around the PIM? I was talking a little bit about microservices and the APIs, but I think there's more to that philosophy overall. And then if you can break them down into its components so that we can get a better understanding of how that tech actually works, that would be great. Thanks. I'll, 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 try, I'll try and explain that. So um, our, our system is sort of based on the Max uh, philosophy, which is uh, uh, microservice, API first, cloud native and headless. Okay. So that's, that's what Max stands for. And there is actually a larger movement now in, in the, I guess, software, at least in the e-commerce industry and in the software industry towards uh, Mac solutions. And there is actually uh, an alliance formed uh, that's called the Mac Alliance. So Mac Alliance, go there, you can see, see all the, the members. And the Bluestone PIM is actually the first PIM that is, is a member of the Mac Alliance and we're Mac certified. And what this means, trying to break this down, <laughs> is that uh, our our service is is microservice based. That means microservices. So there are um, actually more than fifty microservices in in the PIM. And uh, one good example is like there is a built-in dam in the PIM. So that's sort of a microservice. So so that's that's a. Um, uh, digital asset management. Yeah, so that that that's sort of is the microservice thing. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm guessing people uh, know what what uh, microservices are, but uh, so I won't dive into that. Um, but 
but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the API first uh, approach, which I think is very important for, for, for software like, uh, like we provide. Okay. And that is uh, that everything, when we make software, everything starts with communication. So like back in the days, we, we talked about uh, very early computing, uh, you know, uh, back, in, <laughs> back in those days, uh, communication between programs was the last thing you thought of. It was something that you just, uh, you know, did after the code was done. And then you like, I have to send this uh, information to some, something like uh, another component. But uh, the API pro uh, approach just flips that around and, and it's all about communication first. And that means that the flexibility and scalability of these systems are you know, basically endless because everything can communicate with everything. And it's all microservices. Makes sense so far? Makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, because in the old days, you'd have program yeah, A and program B. No, in the old days, you'd have program A and program B. And you'd want to have some of the information from, from program A into program B. It was almost impossible to get them there. You had to download it maybe and then upload it in a different format and do a whole exactly. bunch of different machinations. But now what an API, so an application programming interface allows you to do is you just send all that data to the API. This can understand the API. And then those two programs, even if they don't know each other, can communicate with, with each other clearly and simply because of that API. So if you build the API as part of your infrastructure, you can have all these different components and microservices that don't even know the others exist, but can communicate with them and take data back and forth via the API. Is that fair? Exactly. Um, yeah, so, so that covers the APIs. Uh, um, and that, that's, that's, like I said, that's a key thing here. Right. Um, Moving forward uh, to um, the cloud native part. Right. And that's also an important thing here because uh, being cloud native means that we're born in the cloud. And that's, that's very important because most of our competitors and most software is, is not born in the cloud. They yeah. might be in the cloud now, but that's what I call geography. Uh, they've, they've moved the server uh, to the cloud, they slapped a couple of APIs on top, and they're sort of in the the key things that we we want to talk about when we talk about uh, or we explain that we're cloud native. That's very different than than what I call geography, where you've moved your server to the cloud and slapped some APIs on top. Um, and and the difference is is kind of hard to understand, but but the difference is actually. Uh, very big. This means that we can utilize uh, all the new services that come out in the cloud uh, very efficiently. Uh -huh. So instead of building everything from scratch like you do in a monolith, uh, you can actually uh, utilize, uh, you know, uh, the cloud the way it's supposed to be used. Like I have a couple of examples of that is is uh, that we're using for our dam where we have like pictures, uh, like all the product pictures. Uh, we uh, in Amazon there is uh, something called uh, AWS recognition. So what that does is that it it can recognize stuff, right? So we just connected that service to the dam, and uh, let it run through the dam and recognize all the pictures in the dam, and also then label it. So uh, we have a, a furniture company in, uh, that is a customer. We ran it through there, and they could the the um, the recognition service could recognize different types of wood, different you know all sorts of colors. You can imagine now how this this affects your um, the way of finding or um, using and finding pictures again. You can you can imagine a front end where you can just you know I want all products that are you know in leather and black <laughs> or in uh, oak. And and uh, like all oak uh, tables or whatever, and and the the system will all automatically find that. So so that's that's just an example of how you can use it. Or if you want to go to the nerdy side, we have like there is an, uh, a feature in um, in AWS called uh, oh can't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> Typical, you know. It's okay. It's not a quiz. <laughs> it just fell out of my head right now. Um, when I stop thinking about it, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll definitely remember it. Uh, 
immediately. But anyways, it's a way of uh, orchestrating microservices uh, in AWS. Uh, Lambda scripts and, and microservices that you can you can orchestrate within this uh, uh, solution, and that's something that would you know take months and years for someone who's just moved, like I said, moved their server to the cloud. They have to build everything from scratch. While we can just drag and drop our our uh, code and our uh, you know the different microservices around and use that service immediately. Yeah, I actually think this is really important from a backend technology standpoint, and I'll tell you why, and you tell me where I'm wrong. You can move software into the cloud. And like you said in passing, you can throw some APIs on top of it. But if you're cloud native or born in the cloud, what it means is that every single one of the microservices that you build don't just have the benefit of the APIs, which allows them to communicate with each other but it allows them to immediately and natively take advantage of all the cloud services that are already there. Whereas if, exactly. you, whereas if you write something that was not cloud native and then move it there, that software itself is probably a little confused because it looks around virtually and says, this is an environment that I don't hundred percent understand. It sounds a little weird, but I'm serious about this, right? Because to get it to be like a cloud native application that you're talking about, they'd have to write it from scratch. And that means that exactly. every time they upgrade or do something different, they have to worry that it's not going to properly exist there. And they're missing all the benefits and efficiencies. They're building chuff on top of chuff. And it's more of a hack or what we would say in the software industry, yeah. a, a kludge. And every time you add a kludge into it, you make it way less efficient and much harder to use. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. I think it's a um, perfect ex explanation of that. And uh, and that's what we're trying to preach, sort of, <laughs> is that and, and and the hard thing is that people don't uh, understand the difference because from the outside it's it's yeah. so hard to see the difference. It's, right, it's, right, right. Uh, you know, we say that uh, we have APIs, and our our competitors also say that they have APIs. But but and then I say, but mine are different, and they're like, <laughs> okay, uh, mine taste better. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> So, uh, so, so that's, but it's, it's very important. It, it's all about the future, really, how to utilize, you know, the power of the cloud. Yeah. Uh, and that's, really that's important. not something that, uh, that the software that is not uh, cloud native can do in an efficient way. Exactly. What is headless? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So that, that was the last part of the Mac or right. M A C H. Right. Um, and for a PIM itself, it's, it's harder to explain. It's easier to explain it with a CMS, actually. Okay. Um, but, but what it means is, is, of course, without the head. Yeah, but what, <laughs> is what, that, is the head? what is that head, though, right? That's what I'm really curious yeah. about. Usually, it's, it's actually the UI, right? So it's, it's what the customer sees. Um, so okay. that means that uh, well, let's do the example with the PIM since we're talking about PIMs here. <laughs> so that means that uh, being uh, being API first, everything that we do are APIs, right? And that means that uh, also our UI is built uh, as um, on top of those uh, APIs. So the user interface is a part of uh, like as a layer on top of the APIs. But you'd, that means that you don't really have to use the UI uh, because all the services and all the buttons and everything the UI does is available for you. So that means that our customers and our partners, they can build their own Got UI. It. Now I understand. They, they, don't ha they don't even have to use that. So that's, that's from the PIM perspective. But the headless um, sort of... Th 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 where you sort of separate the back end from the front end. Uh, that, that's where it comes from, actually. But, but for PIM, that, that's what it means, if that makes sense. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, can we do a full e-commerce website only using Bluestone, or do we need something else? <laughs> Based on what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good uh, question, because we, we actually provide a lot of uh, microservices as, as an addition to our, our PIM. So we, our PIM is, is uh, just, um, you know, the, the, the basic PIM. And then we have a lot of microservices that you can add. So we have a marketplace that you can go on to, and then you can select different, you know, 
I need uh, price management and you can add that. And, and, and we even also have like order management and all of, you know, so basically the, the answer is that actually we do have microservices to build a complete, uh, a complete e-commerce site on top, but that, that's, uh, that's uh, our goal. We want to, uh, you know, back in the old days, everyone swam like this. <laughs> you know, you want to, you understand what I mean? You know, yeah. come to me. <laughs> and we want to, we want to try and swim more efficiently. And, and, uh, and we want to connect to the best, like the best of breed philosophy is, is what we're trying to achieve. So we'll be the best PIM. We can provide order management if you, if you want it. Uh, but, uh, but there are many great order management systems out there. So, yeah, so uh, that's sort of the, the idea, but we have like a marketplace and we want partners and our customers to build microservices in that marketplace so that you can actually just build a, a complete commerce site uh, within, within that. Um, yeah. So is this like the Salesforce model or similar to the Salesforce model where they have a platform on which all of their services run, but they have an API for other people to build these other microservices into a marketplace, which then other people can buy so that there's an active sort of buying and selling marketplace there with an incentive for people to build more things so they can sell more things. Are you doing that as well? We're, we're definitely trying to achieve that. There's the... Uh, model uh, is very successful for right. for uh, for some uh, some vendors so so we're definitely trying to achieve something like that but uh, but what we're focusing the most on is is providing a best of breed pim you know yeah but i mean if you're if the sorry if the core competence is api first then almost by definition the platform itself should be able to handle third party developers just going you know, it would be great if we had this. They build it themselves. As you said, it's headless, right? So they could build UIs, they could build user experiences, they can build a bunch of different things, put exactly. it into the marketplace and then sell it for other people. Because at some level, like there isn't an infinite number of developers that work for Bluestone. Nope. And others that are building great stuff can enhance your platform by putting it there and then buying, being able to buy and sell them there, right? Yeah, and, and we have that already. So that, that story has begun. So we have partners, tech partners that are building, uh, building up uh, apps and adding it to our marketplace. Really interesting. That's cool. Do you, how do you handle multi-language? <laughs> um, so in, in that's a, that's a also a good question because uh, we uh, in the PIM itself, you can handle um, as many languages as you have. So. We have, uh, I think, I think uh, one of our clients has like 17 languages or something. But we also take it to the next level uh, because we also handle what we call context within a language. So that means that, let, let's say we, we have a, a flies, you know, sporting gear <laughs> uh, customer uh, that is very large and they have like seven different concepts. Like they have them, they're, they have like a, a, a general sports store, you know, and then they have like this special concept for running shoes. Okay. Outdoorsy concept where they sell outdoors gear. And it's all actually the same products that they sell, but they're, they're marketed very differently. So like in the, uh, like in the general, you know, huge warehouse, they have, they have the same running shoes. But they're, you know, it's not the same pictures and it's not the same description as in the specialized running uh, store that they have. Makes sense? So, so that's what we the, call context. So that's based on the context in which they want the user to buy them and to understand what that product is doing. It could be the exact same product. Yes, exactly. So, and that's also something we can differentiate, uh, differentiate within the PIM. So that's a very cool feature is that you can set up this this where you can sort of inherit uh, product information from a uh, context to the next and, uh, and, um, and concepts uh, sort of uh, within the PIM so that you don't have the same selling description on the, on the, the different web stores. Is there a supply chain control angle here? I'll tell you what I mean. You, if the Bluestone PIM is connecting to, let's just say, 
500 suppliers, right? That then, and those 500 suppliers are connected to 10,000 customers on the other side. I, I like to think about this in aggregate terms, right? You kind of know what's being bought, what's being supplied because it's going through the Bluestone PIM. And I understand data privacy and things like that. But there, is there a way that, again, you can just provide sort of advisory services to potential clients on both sides of that to tell them you're running out of this via the PIM or the suppliers, like you may want to make more of these because historically you've had more of them ordered in November than you do in mm -hmm. February. That's, that's definitely uh, possible. Uh, and it's, it's such a great um, sort of story. Uh, but we, we don't, well, I haven't seen that in practice yet, uh, but uh, there, is, there is no technical, uh, you know, limitation or anything that, that you know, um, says that you, you, sh you can't do it like that. Right. Uh, so so, um, so I, I would like to see that, uh, that story in the future because uh, we could definitely make that, that happen. Right. And also, again, because there are so many products, I, I, I asked a couple of guys this a couple of days ago too, but because there are so many products going in and out of the PIMS and the ERP systems and stuff that you're monitoring and helping manage, is there a way to deprecate but also to uplift certain products that may be competing with each other through kind of an ad word game that takes place. So does that make sense? In other words, in Google, yeah. if there's two pizza places that make great pizza in the same town, they'd like buy ad words to get higher ranking so that they can get discovered yeah. earlier. Does that work inside a PIM as well? Well, uh, usually that's, that's a personalization and the front end kind of uh, service. Uh, mm -hmm. You can definitely connect that to the PIM. We have a connector to uh, sort of rating and reviews that okay. are brought back to the PIM. So that kind of information is, is you know, if you, if you give it a five star on this channel and that channel. And the beauty of having that in the PIM is that you can centralize uh, ratings and reviews across different platforms because it writes back to the PIM, which is a centralized right. information uh, hub, right? Right. Um, so, so definitely possible, but, but uh, you're moving into the, uh, to the front end personalization uh, sort of area. Yeah, and how about recommendation engines, right? In other words, you bought this product, you may want to buy this product too, because if you're operating in this space, you're probably operating in that space. Yeah, and that, that's something that we actually have uh, in, in place already that we have, uh, uh, th th this is what we call relations in, in the PIM. So you have uh, like product relations, you have upsell, cross-sale, yep. and all of that, and, and uh, related products and... and uh, uh, and all of that. And what we actually have in the PIM is, or we're, we're, we're launching it pretty soon, is that we have an AI, or actually it's a machine learning algorithm that goes through uh, similar products. And then it suggests uh, for you which, uh, which sort of uh, uh, you know, accessories or uh, comparable products that you have that should be a part of this. And that's something that we're launching pretty soon. So, so the, the, that's, a, that's something that we're, we're very excited about. And where do you get the data for that? Like, how do you, where, where do you find the product that you're going to suggest me as a complementary product? Yeah, so that's a good question because uh, what, what you do is that, uh, that that sort of starts out as a manual process. You have to say that, the, that this product is... is uh, is linked to this product or this product is a replacement for that product and so forth. And then you run the algorithm and then it suggests uh, new for you and you accept them. And then the algorithm gets better <laughs> mm. and then you run it again and then it gets better. You see where uh, th th that's, that's sort of, you, you have to teach it. It's, it's like, a, it's like an, a, a, an AI or a, a machine learning, um, you know, basics that you have to teach it what is, what is good. And then uh, it takes it from there, sort of. So it's doing that among my hundreds of thousands of products, right? Yeah, that's, that's the idea. So that's so, idea. You, yeah. so it, it, gives me, it gives me an idea, guys, with all the questions that you had changed to do to, to together. <laughs> it, it gave me an idea because like what we are doing in my company called Dr. Tech, actually, uh, we are 
a software where people can create their own e-commerce web websites. So we target small merchants. So basically like we compete directly with, with Shopify, for example. So you understand better what we are doing. And we have API as well, where we can connect with like tons of software. So it's pretty cool. And I'm thinking like my, my sellers are way too small for you because it's more of a kind of sellers who have 100 product or 500 products max, maximum. But as a whole, that's a lot of products. Exactly. If we consider all of my sellers and all the product on the platform, then that's a ton of stuff. And then everything that you said, like with machine learning, with um, image recognition, with, with like products, uh, comp comparison or suggestion and all of that stuff, I think my customer would be happy to have that even, even at small scale, right? Because at the moment you only give that at large scale for the customer who wanted to do the PM but not to, to a small one. And I'm thinking like maybe there is a way to integrate your PM into my whole platform and just like um, cluster each of the little seller to access your services, but at small scale. You know, that sounds exciting. Let, <laughs> let me give you an API key and let's go. <laughs> <laughs> now he's doing sales. I thought I, was the, sales. I thought I was the sales guy. <laughs> he's taking my job back. It's not fair. That's true, Michael. You just lost your job. Sorry. Just lost my job before I even really got hired. But uh, is it something that is like, can we think about it? Is it something doable? Can we use the PIM for that or? Yeah, it, it, is, it, is, it is doable, but there are many things that are sort of... Um, uh, doable and uh, the, the 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 question I always ask now in this this sort of this API economy world is that is that a service that is specialized for it is is a like maybe that's that's not the the key feature of of our PIM it's definitely possible to do it but that's all, always a question I ask myself now if, yeah, if for that's sure. a, if there are are services out there that are perfect and exactly what you're looking for. So that's that's the first question I ask myself. Um, but definitely, you know, uh, we'll love to do stuff like that. So so and and, and try new stuff and and uh, see if it works. So I'm all about that. So so uh, you know, let's let's uh, hook up after this. <laughs> after the and, uh, Perfect. Take it from there. How long has Bluestone Pim been around? So 2016 was was when we uh, when we started making the software. But it's actually built on on uh, on an good old uh, or on the back of a good old uh, e-commerce company from Norway uh, that was founded back in the 90s. Oh, really? Which but, company but was, was that? Hmm? Which company Sorry. was that? Uh, that's a company called Webon. Webon. So that, that was, but, but we did a clean break in, in 2016 mm -hmm. and built up a new company. Wow, in five years. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. Built an entire PIM. Really interesting stuff. And were you one of the original employees? I was actually not. I think I, I was actually uh, convinced to be a part of it uh, because <laughs> of my uh, SaaS uh, background, SaaS background, I think. So, really? so I was actually headhunted for the position, yes. Good stuff. What yeah. else, Martin? That's definitely cool. And we should definitely let every conversation off, offline <laughs> for, for integrating <laughs> Dr. Tech with, with your solution because... I wonder like, what's your view on the future of e-commerce? Like, how do you see e-commerce in the next two to five years? Because like on the show, we like to talk about what's happened in the back end on, on e-commerce yeah. and like nobody have an idea of like what you are doing and how important is, is the PM right. and like what, where yeah. Bluestone, you know, act into the AA trust system and right. we, where it fits, uh, where it, where it fits and like yeah. why it's important, but like without you, e-commerce is way more difficult if not impossible Possible. for many 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 companies right so you're definitely super important so i'm wondering how do you see the future as from your point of view yeah. well, five years. from my point yeah from my point of view i definitely see the movement towards uh uh this this max of a philosophy where yeah. where you sort of uh you know you uh, composable uh commerce really where you where you sort of uh, utilize the the, um, the microservices or the services that, that are out there and you build your solutions based on that instead of uh, of the monoliths that we have uh, today so i definitely see uh, that as as the future going forward because you can uh, it's so much easier to replace parts and things and it's not uh, as attached to each other you can you can 
you can you know replace a front end without even touching anything else really and that wasn't possible before you had to build like you have to build everything from from the bottom up and now you can just you know okay uh, this doesn't work for us let's just replace the front end okay the order management isn't perfect for us let's let's just move towards something else uh you know uh, a pim uh, you know uh, m you can replace the pim fairly easily and so I, I, I see that uh, that the movement towards composable um, commerce is is um, yeah it's a snowball rolling. <laughs> I I have another idea just based on what you just said again. <laughs> so he should be writing this stuff down, shouldn't he? Sorry, yeah. he should be writing some of this stuff down. <laughs> we should be recording it. <laughs> we should be recording it. That's exactly right. <laughs> I wish somebody was. <laughs> <laughs> I do, guys. That's okay. We got the we got the, the, the recording, <laughs> so we're not gonna lose all of these ideas. But like you giving me an idea because as um, software that allow people to to create their own e-commerce website, like of course we have also some huge hosting cost, right? Like we get to host the the, the the website, we have to be sure that they are available, they are they are up and running, like. 24 seven and with no downtime or very, very small, right? And also like oh, all of that can that cost some money in Austin, in databases and all of that kind of stuff. And with everything that you said, it seems that you are also hosting into your database all the data about the product, right? So can I imagine outsourcing my database of products to you? I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> Well, uh, that that really spawns uh, an exciting or uh, an interesting discussion because uh, what you're actually talking about there is is that uh, the data is uh, is uh, replicated so many times throughout. Exactly. If you look if you look at um, a, a full commerce site, you actually have the same same data yeah. in the, in like in a large organization, you have the same data in the ERP and then in the MDM, and then you right. have it in the PIM, and then you have it in the e-commerce, and then you have it in the CMS. And this is this is one of our differentiators, is what, what we're trying to achieve and what we've done already uh, for for a large uh, large customer is that our dam is actually um, based on a CDN. So that means that you can use all the all everything, all the files and all the pictures and all the videos and everything that is in the dam, directly all the way through through to the front end. Right. With there, you know, you're just passing along the URL, uh, and there is no need to actually move the data. Right. There's no data replication necessary because it all sits in one place. Yeah, and like it all sits in one place. Data replication. And that's also sort of, sort of the main idea we have also for for our uh, future updates in 22. Uh, where we can do that with all the product data too. And that means that you can actually run a complete commerce site on top, directly on top of the PIM. And yeah, using that's... the PIM as directly as a background or as a backend to that. So, so it's very interesting. Yeah, that's, that's completely my idea because like imagine if we find a way to work together and if we can like provide additional services to my sellers thanks to the services that already exist at Bluestone right. and then we need to replicate the data from my database to yours it's not very efficient so if no. we can just like no, remove exactly. from my database and send to yours yeah. then it's just efficient for me so that's perfect that's less problems as well for me but also the data access can be much faster right and the data access can be much faster and like um as a base yeah. cms um in uh, in dr tech we use wordpress and there is yep. a whole um a whole trend in wordpress the last few years with headless cms with right. people yep. either right. using wordpress as the back end or yep. also using WordPress as the front end, like it could it could it could fit both. So which means that the API that we are using is already built for 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 headless and working perfectly fine. So we can definitely use like Dr. Tech as the front end because we have like all the drag and drop builder and all the 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 UI builder for people to create the front end of their site and then like just like use Bluestone as the back end for the product management and use the, all the services to enrich the experience and stuff that we would not have to develop ourselves at the, at the, the, the tech and then provide a lot of value to our sellers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just, so just an idea. <laughs> yeah, 
But but it's it's uh, it's a very good idea because I think that replicating it, the data doesn't make sense. And when we you're already in the platform, like we're on AWS, yeah, you know, it's it's we're talking about moving actually data from S3 bucket to S3 bucket. Yeah, right. That's actually, that's actually yeah. what we're talking about because <laughs> right. but it's a different system. But it's actually just moving it around in AWS doesn't make sense. Just link it instead and put it behind uh, you know CDNs global CDNs and, and uh, you know, you, you should be good to go. I'm, I'm just wondering one thing, like, because you said that maybe Bluestone tomorrow can do e-commerce site, like full e-commerce site from, from like from A to Z, but how do you handle the, um, like the, the calculation part, what we have on WordPress, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the like, um, how do you say? Like how, like hold the calculation for the how do I explain that for all the feature for for example like for creating a loyalty program of or gift card all of this kind of stuff that needs some calculation power some RAM or CPUs where you need actual servers for, for that and you cannot do full headless let's say like how how will you handle that are you also going to handle the this part? Well, uh, like I said. Uh, we're we're a, a a PIM first and foremost. Okay, yeah, PIM we're, first. <laughs> uh, but but uh, definitely there are. Uh, that's the beauty of this. Uh, you know, the the API economy is that we can connect to to anything, and and mm -hmm. we have you know services that our customer use that that does that for you. And and the, the beauty of API first is that you can just connect to that and and uh, and and use you know best of breed solutions for for what you need. So um, really. so maybe this is also where something that we should discuss because that's something that we do pretty good at, at Dr. Tech, like yeah. the calculation of all these parts. Right. Yeah. And uh, you know, if, once again, we can connect with the API. So. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That sounds good. That sounds great. <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you, thank you very much, Martin, for this. <laughs> We have Martin, we have Morton, we have yeah. Michael. This is like the 3M company. <laughs> Morton Nace, yeah. DVP Technology of Bluestone. This was really great. Thank you for taking the time to answer all of our questions and just like educate us on PIM. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.